I was in Cappadocia in November and December, and as it turns out, with my wife Susan, uh, as it turns out, a perfect time to work, cold, but practically devoid of tourists, and thus easy to get up at four in the morning and hitchhike out into the landscape to paint undisturbed in the abandoned churches. Uh, one early morning, uh, when the snow was just beginning to fall onto this otherworldly landscape of ochre, pink, and gold, I emerged from an abandoned church in a remote valley, turned my back to the wind and looked across the valley, and just beyond the tall tufa structures, known locally again as very dunes, grazed a herd of wild horses. Short, stocky, and chromatically akin to the stone around them. Here they were, the equestrian descendants who gave Cappadocia its name, Land of Beautiful Horses. Um, I piece paper so I can work in the narrowest, hard to reach tunnels underground. Uh, my paper, so there's a practical reason why I'm broken up the way they are. Uh, my paper stays damp due to the high humidity below ground and disintegrates in the best sense under repeated erasing and sanding as I search for form and space. I paint and draw with watercolors, charcoal, inks, and even the volcanic soil underfoot. What do I find underground? A quiet, so complete that I can hear my heartbeat. This makes me very nervous, so I tend to hum. Uh, it mazes with dank odors and high humidity, a constant 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Skeletons, nearly 2,000 years old, embrace one another in their tombs. Blue. Uh, and if disturbed, these skeletons would turn to dust. Paintings and carvings form mysterious iconographic hybrids of an emerging spiritual language. A language, obviously, of necessity. And I find the strangest of wildlife. Long, worm-like creatures with millipede-like legs coexist with 10-inch long phosphorescent mantises that give off an eerie green light. Half-inch milk-colored poisonous spiders crawl into their milk color. Poise, uh, <coughs> they crawl into my shoes and make me a regular customer in the pharmacy. Transparent spiders, transparent blind spiders the size of my hand make clicking sounds on the walls of the silent tunnels as they're attracted to my lamps. Aphids skitter by the thousands of stalactites as they flee from my lights. Now you have to understand that the, where I work, I'm uh, working at this point uh, relatively close to, this is an amazing thing, right underneath Mussolini's villa. And Mussolini saw himself as a new Caesar, of course, and was responsible for much of the excavations that were going on and, uh, and some of the most important excavations. Uh, in Rome, uh, 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 Mussolini, under his villa, they found a Jewish catacomb, which I found very uh, beautiful and ironic. Uh, the, um, uh, and the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the catacomb where I've been working uh, for most of the year uh, uh, have root structures that come down and they can descend as much as 30 or 40 feet and they're covered because of the moisture and the mineral deposits, they form stalactites that then create these tunnels that are shimmering with silver light. I develop my pieces slowly, carrying them back and forth between my sites, cross-pollinating ideas, locations, and subject matter. In the studio, I extend the process further by building three-dimensional models. Animal bones and old tools substitute for on-site trees and stumps.
stacks of abandoned mud lots houses peppered with oblong tunnels become archaeological labyrinths in miniature. To complement this work started on site, I built a library of sketchbooks, three of which are three of which are outside, um, and uh, uh, you can't look through them, but you can look on one of the this and uh, these, is a, these sketchbooks form an archive of images from museums and archaeological sites and landscapes. This is one of my types of sketchbooks. I have three, and I'll tell you what they are. The studio uh, is the perfect place in, my, in Providence for these images to merge with my primary sites. Perhaps most importantly, second sketchbooks, I have my library of unconscious states. For the past 30 years, I've documented my dreams in sketchbooks with narratives and drawings, and I do this every morning at 4 a.m. With narratives that are absolutely crucial to everything that I'm doing. Often these dreams have proven to be disturbingly prophetic, harbingers of where I need to go next. All of my sites are transformed into one world, one cosmology, one overwhelming threshold where the seen and the unseen coexist. Time is no longer linear, but rather elastic, continuous and circular. Trees and mosses dissolve into tunnels and roots. Friends and family are ghosts who reside with strange and marvelous creatures. This is my preferred world, the shadow world of memory and time. Uh, just to insert this before I finish, there's a third kind of sketchbook that I keep. I came to RISD 24 years ago, and I went to my first faculty meeting, and I remember I called my mother, and she said, so, how did it go? And I said, well, there's this amazing thing. You sit in the faculty meetings, and there's a guy standing up here talking, and everybody in the room is drawing. <laughs> And I said, oh, I'm in the right place. Uh, so I keep, uh, uh, I, I, I keep uh, shelves and shelves of descriptive, descriptive drawings that I'm making that also, um, that usually are on the back of um, the, uh, the, the uh, agendas that they hand out at the meetings that are completely uh, useless. Um, so again, uh, this is my preferred world, the shadow world of memory, time, and dreams. Perhaps the Russian mystic, Pavel Florensky, describes the boundary region that I'm most interested in, this threshold, best when he writes that, quote, we experience moments when two worlds grow so very near in us that we can see their intimate touching, where the veil of visibility is torn apart and through that tear, we can sense that the invisible world, still unearthly, still invisible, is breathing. And that both this and another world are dissolving 